Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Education meeting, January 19, 2023, for Curry Tech County Schools. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, and at, to begin with, I would like to welcome um, Jason Banks as our new board member, and uh, of course, Miss um, Parker as well, although she was here last month. And uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Ms. Peters uh, to do the invocation, and then Mrs. Rose is going to follow you for something. When a flashlight, oh, okay, sorry. When the flashlight grows dim or quits working, do you just throw it away? Of course not. You change the batteries. When a person messes up or finds themselves in a dark place, do you cast them aside? Of course not. You help them change their batteries. Some need AA, attention and affection. Some need AAA, attention, affection, and acceptance. Some need C, compassion. Some need D, direction. And if they still don't seem to shine, simply sit with them quietly and share your light. Just thought that would be nice. January is Mental Health Awareness Month, so I think it's important that we look to our friends and neighbors and family. Thank you, Ms. Peters. And I would, I would just like to extend sympathies to the family of Mr. Jim Sparks. He was a teacher here in Curry Tech County. Um, James Jim Ellis Sparks Jr., age 80, of Powell's Point, died on Saturday, December 24th. He was born in Pine Tops, North Carolina, on May 9th, 1942, to the late James Ellis Sparks Sr. and Sarah Sutton Sparks, he was the husband of Sylvia Johnson Sparks, also a retired teacher of Curry Tuck. Mr. Sparks was a teacher with the Curry Tuck County School System until his retirement. He was a member of Hebron United Methodist Church in Jarvisburg. In addition to his wife of more than 60 years, he is survived by two sons, Jonathan Bradley Brad Sparks and James Dwight Sparks. A sister, Diane Sparks Chapel, five grad grandchildren, Bradley Sparks, Jonathan Sparks, Bagby Sparks, Eliza Sparks, and Parker Sparks, and two nephews, Tim Chapel and Tom, Tom Chapel. He was predeceased by a son, Daniel O'Neill Sparks, and they held a graveside service on Friday, December 30th. In addition to uh, sending condolences to Mr. Sparks' family, we want to also send condolences to the family of Aonesty Smith, who was a former Curry Tuck County student, and also to Anita Cotton, a former Curry Tuck teacher who lost her husband, Bobby Smith. So if we could have a moment of silence for these three families, please. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Durham if he would come to the podium and introduce the student who's going to do the Pledge of Allegiance for us, and then he will stay because he is the school spotlight this month. Yes, ma'am. Um, good evening, uh, Madam Chair, uh, board members, Dr. Lutz. Um, I have the pleasure of bringing forth for the pledge uh, this evening um, Cadet Staff Sergeant uh, Destiny Johnson. Uh, Destiny is a uh, two-year member of the ROTC program. She's also a member of our marching band. Uh, one of the, I think one of the cool things is that the reason she joined was to overcome her fear of public speaking, and she also does our pledge uh, every morning. So she's definitely done that, and we're super proud of her. So um, this is uh, Cadet Staff Sergeant Destiny Johnson. Good evening. May everyone please rise for the pledge of our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Destiny. Yes, Dr. Durham. Good evening again. Um, it's always uh, a really cool thing to be able to uh, be spotlighted uh, here in the county. Um, we're having a great school year. Um, we're just starting or finishing up our first semester. We had our first day of exams today. Um, it went really, really well. Um, so we're, 
we're excited about what we have going on. There's so many things that, that we could bring forward or so many people or students or teachers because we have, um, even with us today, when Colonel was here, we've got so many people that are with us now that, uh, that help us to, to do what we do, and that's educate kids on a daily basis uh, to the best of our ability. Um, but uh, for this spotlight today, we're going to, uh, I'm going to bring forth one of our best CTE teachers that we have, that is Mr. Charles Knotts. Regionals and all of that does cost money. Um, and then beginning in March, the fundraiser is going to wrap up. Um, and then it's going to be a cornhole board swing picnic table gift certificate um, fundraiser. And essentially, we're going to be having the carpentry class participate in that as well, trying to continue that um, school outreach. Um, and so wrap up that. And then CTE celebration will also be wrapping up. Um, and then part of that is our champion chapter, which FELA hosts um, different events that they encourage you to do. And then the more events that you participate in, you get points at the moment. Going into that, we have a list of everyone who is competing in our Saints competition. Naomi French, she's participating in economics. Jacob is participating in graphic design. Sean is participating in marketing. Shane is participating in personal finance. Kaylin is participating in political science. I myself is, are competing for public speaking. Sid is competing for sales presentation. Daniel is competing for impromptu speaking. Serenity is participating in entrepreneurship, and Hayden and Annabelle are participating in sports and entertainment marketing. Going into our three E's, we like to prepare students. Our three E's are enroll, enlist, and employ. For enrollment, we try to help build your college application up by listing the competitions you've competed in, the recognition you've had, even putting that you've be, been an FBLA officer also helps. We do enlist, we help with enlisting to armed forces by helping you with your teamwork and your leadership skills, being able to work with a variety of people that you probably haven't even met before, and being able to step up to the plate and show that you can be a leader of your group. We also do employ, which helps for your career. We do it through public speaking, communication, your teamwork skills, citizenship skills, problem solving skills. We've done workshops during our competitions where you work with people that you've never met before, randomly selected, and you help problem solve. We did inventions with our group, and it was a great experience. Um, so I mentioned before that FBLA is a competition-based club, but we are also community-driven. What this means is that FBLA wants to inspire our students to learn the importance of community. Um, so we are of course learning leadership development skills, but it's also how to put those skills into play and practice for the benefit of other people, not just ourselves. Um, so we've had several events, um, but one of those that I want to talk about today is the thank you cards that we wrote for our senior center. Um, and then we also collected the new blankets, and then we're hoping to have more events like this in the future. And I just want to thank you for this opportunity to speak on our FBLA and what we've done, and thank you for this opportunity and all that you've been able to give us so far. Thank you. Thank you. Would y'all um, please state your full names and what um, are you sophomores, juniors, seniors? What's what's up? I'm a senior at Vetfra. I'm a junior at Curry High School. I'm Serena Duran. I'm a senior at Curry County High School. Okay. And I, I have a question. Do you have to be taking a business class to join the FBLA club? No. No, it's open to any high schooler, and I know they have it at the middle school as well. And what will you two girls be competing in, regionally or state level? Have you already done regional competition? Yes. I competed for public speaking, so I got third place, so I'm going to states to do Okay. Good. And my event is only at states, but it will be entrepreneurship. Ah, okay. And what day did you tell me the meetings are? Every Thursday, every week. Thursday, okay. During At power, power hour. hour. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Might well, pop in one day. And wishing you the best at States. Yes. Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. Okay, I think I need to turn the meeting over to um, yes. you, Dr. Lutz. Well, yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and Serenity, when I moved down here, she was one of the first people I met through a Skype meeting with Miss Sandy Reynolds. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, you're a senior now. So 
<laughs> life is flying by. So, okay, uh, this is uh, National School Board Month, and we'd like to recognize our board members here in North Carolina. North Carolina, how about in Currituck County? <laughs> we live in North Carolina. I think too. I could read from a script. <laughs> All right. So, uh, recognize our board members, Mr. Jason Banks, Ms. Dwan Kraft, Ms. Kelly Williams-Peters, Ms. Janet Rose, and Mrs. Dana Parker. On behalf of the Currituck County Schools, we extend our sincere gratitude to each of you for your commitment and dedication to our students and community. As part of this recognition, we'd also like to thank our student board members, Sophia O'Shear and Scarlett Stalitz. We are honored to have you as part of the board and appreciate your valuable input and participation. At this time, we'd like to present each of you with a small gift. Thank you. Wow, it's pretty. Fancy. Choosing to be a member of the school board is, um, it is most appreciated. It's truly giving back to your community <laughs> to make sure that we have our best schools Don't possible. At the conclusion of the meeting, this evening, we would also ask for everyone to remain so we get a picture. Again, we thank you for your service to Currituck County Schools, and I appreciate you allowing me to work for you. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to work with all of you as well. Um, so this is the time for our public uh, comment session. The public comment session is a time when an individual or a group can address the board about our schools. This is not a time to speak about issues or concerns involving identifiable personnel or students. Matters of this nature should be submitted in writing to the superintendent and your concerns will be addressed. Individuals or groups will be called in the order in which they signed up and will be asked to limit their remarks to three minutes. Please state your name and address when I call you up. And the first person who signed up is Robert Griffin. Would you come <coughs> forward please, Mr. Griffin? Robert Griffin, 436 Poplar Branch Road in Poplar Branch. Good evening. So I just wanted to relay to you, um, we have a, a program that we do through the schools in our home rooms called Character Strong. And we meet with our home rooms once or twice a month. And my particular home room is comprised of seniors. And so our most recent topic was on leadership and one of the questions that was asked was, what is something in your school that needs improvement? That was asked in general to the seniors. And this senior's response, and I was, I liked the day when we taught cursive, the penmanship wasn't the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> but this senior's response was, more, speci more specified classes corresponding to their desired career of choice. More specified classes that students were interested in. And I understand that we have some limitations as to what we can offer because of mandates from the state and the state curriculum. I don't know that seniors and other students always understand that, but I certainly do. But one of my concerns is that we do receive some mandates from the state and we just accept them without pushback. And I think that's wrong because I don't think the state is always right in their decision making. And case in point was the graduation of 2020 when this board unanimously decided to hold a graduation even though the state said we couldn't do it. But we did it, and it was the right thing to do. You guys on the board have a tremendous responsibility to do what is right for our children. And sometimes a pushback is the right thing to do. And one thing that is right for our children is to educate the whole child. And currently, over the course of my time in education, we have begun to put too much emphasis on curriculum, 
and assessments. And we need more emphasis on non-curricular items, things such as how you interact with others and how you take care of yourself. Because I would close with this remark. There was an article in the News and Observer about two weeks ago, and it said that more than 20% of high school students have seriously considered suicide. That's one in five. And we've got five members on our board. That would be comparable to one of you out of the five of you. I think we have some issues that are more serious than we have faced in a long time. And I just think we need to make sure we have our priorities where they need to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Griffin. Thank, thank you, Mr. Griffin. The next person on the list is Tressa Martin. Uh, Tressa Martin, 105 Shepherd's Way, Knox Island. Uh, some of you guys may remember me from August when I approached you guys about homeschoolers participating in athletics. I have further found out that uh, homeschoolers are able to at the high school level provided that they do two classes. I come to ask you guys if we can move forward with changing those middle school rules. There is, in our community, where we live so far from things, specialized sports, specialized clubs are extremely hard to find, to fill in the gaps. Homeschoolers, are known for filling in the gaps of things that we know we need to educate them more on. But in this instance, I can't get my kids and other homeschool moms can't get their kids things that they may want. Um, for example, <laughs> baseball, you can go out in town and find baseball lessons anywhere you want to, find any teams, wrestling, cheerleading, soccer, those things, more specialized, you can't get in town without significant financial, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but more than that, um, some of them aren't even available. Um, I know that some of the things that have been asked are, well, if your kid is wanting something like this, why can't you put them in school? For some kids, the education at home is better for the one-on-one -on -one instruction but we are lacking in some of those areas. Any, everywhere that I have looked, I have not been able to find anything that states that we cannot have middle schoolers participate. It is a county decision and not a state decision. And I really ask you guys to take that into consideration. I know that homeschoolers as a whole are very active. They're very active in the things that they do. Um, a lot of them lead a lot of, uh, lead their co-ops and their children and their education and stuff like that. In doing this, I know that you will have help in the boosters, <laughs> volunteers, things like that, that, you know, um, we can be a help of. We would love to see this. I know that I'm the only one up here speaking, but I have spoken to multiple coaches. I have spoken to parents, public school and homeschool parents. And the support is there. and. I really hope that you guys can help us move forward with this or find out how we can. And it doesn't even have to be sports. I know that one homeschool mom asked me about band and things like that. So if we could please just <laughs> uh, find something to balance it. Okay. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Thank you. And uh, I, th I understand that you um, have a statement from Ms. Lindsay Guianzo that you're going to read. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and there's a, three more homeschool parents that will be emailing you guys who could not make it here tonight either. Okay. So could you state her name and her address, please? Uh, Lindsay Guianzo. Um, I don't know her address offhand. I believe it's Dahlia Drive, not Silent. Okay. Uh, and I do have the printout, and it has her phone number on it if you need okay. it. 
She said, good, e good evening. I have had at least eight years in this county and I am an active parent supporter in my local elementary school and I also homeschool. The reason I homeschool isn't the reason I am petitioning this, the board today. I am petitioning the school, petitioning for the school board to seriously consider allowing our homeschool students to participate in the local spo school sports. We already utilize the local rec situation situation but they are limited in what sports they are able to give the community our kids are also friends with the local public school kids we already have our tax dollars going towards the public school so i don't understand why they can't be a participant in the after school activities offered we would be subjected to all the booster fundraising and physical readiness that the public school requires of its students if I can enroll my homeschool children into the DMV program through the high school, I don't understand why they can't participate in the local clubs and sports as well. My son would like to have been able to participate in a few after school sports. My daughter really wanted to continue with her cheer, but can't. She switched to soccer offered at the rec center or rec sports, but eventually aged out. I have many other children that would enjoy to participating in school sports eventually. I would ask that you please change your board rules and allow it. Federally and state, we are protected. There are no laws against us for participating in the local school clubs and sports. It's a matter of, of a few motions and approvals, especially considering that more and more have started homeschooling in the past few years and, not have, and have not dwindled, but in fact have kept increasing in number. There will be more people requesting this in the years to come. We are not going away. Sincerely, Lindsay Guinazzo. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It's now time for our student board member report. Oh. I got here a little late, but I'll please speak to public. Oh. I got caught up in traffic. I was coming home at work late. Yeah. I don't know what the policy is on that. Um, so Yes, Mr. Snowden, that will be fine. Uh, John Henry Snowden III, 112 Maple Road, Maple, North Carolina. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Yvette for her expeditious uh, getting information to me on the PPE, per pupil expenditures, and the tuition information. And I would like to thank the Shawboro kindergarten class. I enjoyed that while I watched the last meeting. Uh, the last month's meeting for their ag presentation. It's really refreshing to see kids get involved in agriculture, and you'll hear soon why I'm interested in that. I am a product of Curry Tuck County Schools. I graduated from the high school in 1982. I went to Central Elementary, and I went to J.P. Knapp Junior High School. First year that we were in there. I am now a senior software engineer at the medical school in Norfolk, Eastern Virginia Medical School. I am not a doctor, but I can tell you which one's got good grades. <laughs> the ones you want to see. I'm in charge of student information systems, all of the grades, payroll, digital attendance, and immunization records for incoming students. So basically, I touch the students from the time they enter to the time they leave. So I'm, I'm fulfilling, I'm helping make doctors that come back out into our communities. Um, I have worked in the web and database industry for Fortune 500 companies in banking, manufacturing, higher education, and local government. I am a degreed mathematician, and I actually use algebra about once or twice a week. Everybody goes, why did we have that? Mm -hmm. Mr. Griffin will appreciate that because his father taught me in school. Uh, in 2001, I moved back to Curry Tuck and I started a newspaper, and I have distinguished as the longest published newspaper in Curry Tuck County. I could have gone along to get along, however, I asked questions. Um, I successfully sued the Curry Tuck County government on two counts of public meeting violation in 2006 and 2007. They failed to record the meetings, they failed to invite the press, and they failed to keep minutes. And they held it in a secure facility where the public could not attend. Um, and I represented myself. Mark Twain said once that the man who represents himself has a fool for a lawyer. I think I might have disproved that. And because of that, I was called a troublemaker. Remember troublemaker. It'll be on my tombstone. Will Craddock was elected in November to ask questions. I told him he could put a sign in my yard. You don't put a sign in my yard unless you have my endorsement. I live on the corner of Maple Road. 
and was 68, Maple, North Carolina, and it was actually called Griggs Corner when it was founded in 1890. There's a little bit of history. You will leave here learning something. Will was a troublemaker, good trouble. He asked questions. He understands that he's here to serve the students, students first, but he also understands you all have an obligation to the taxpayers. I pay enough taxes on my property in Maple and the other farmland I rent to subsidize two children in your schools. That's $2,800 per year local contribution. Most of the houses you see popping up in Moyoc only pay $1,500 a year. They do not pay to put the students in school. We, we are. Can I have one more minute? No, I promise you one. actually are done. Okay. Mr. You. Banks, ask questions. You lucked into that seat. Thank you, Damon. You're welcome. It's now time for our student board member report. Uh, it looks like you're the only one here tonight. <laughs> so, Scarlett? Yes, all right, tonight we'll be starting with Central Elementary. Central Eagles started off the new year with a bang. Our student awards assembly will be held on February 10th to celebrate all the achievements our students have worked for the worked so hard for. We are getting ready for our very first Boosterthon fun run beginning February 22nd. This year's theme is the Grand Land Adventure. Students will be learning character building skills as well as learning about national parks. Families are invited to pledge throughout the entire program. Next will be Currituck County High School. Currituck County High School senior Sierra Peelman was awarded the distinction of honorable mention on, the, on her 2023 sculpture portfolio by the Scholastics Art and Writing Awards. Students entering the senior portfolio division submit a body of artworks for juried review. The Scholastics Art Award is highly competitive, including 54 countries ranging from the east coast of NC all the way through Durham in the midsection of NC. Only 14 students received award recognition for the portfolio division. Dylan Cooper made first chair in Barry Sachs and Danielle Phillips made fourth chair in French Horn in the Eastern District of North Carolina. Congratulations to Miss Santa and the CCS students for their amazing performance of Mamma Mia. Currituck County Middle School. Congratulations to sixth grade student Brooklyn Arbogast for her winning submission for our yearbook cover. Students and staff voted and selected her artwork for the 2022-2023 yearbook cover. A special thanks to Sydney Strobridge from Navy Federal Credit Union in Moyoc for visiting our school and meeting with our seventh grade students recently. This collaboration taught students with, about budgeting, writing a check, and general financial knowledge. Special thanks to Ms. Bartolotta for coordinating this experience for our students. Next will be Griggs Elementary School. January 26th, Griggs will, Griggs will hold our monthly PTO slash Title I night. This month is our art festival and annual Title I meeting. Miss Lasher will be reading a book of everyday wonders, a book of firsts to our families. We will have snacks and drinks and families will vote on artwork created by our students. The chosen artwork will move on to the district art show. We are in our third month of At 10, We Dance. This incentive supports our attendance at Griggs. In the class has 100 per, 100 per, if the class has 100% for 10 days in a row, they receive an ice cream and dance party. We have, have, we have had five classrooms receive their party so far. Students are excited and want to come to school. For JPNAP Early College, we have some fall EOC testing data on proficiency. Biology is a 28 out of 39, and that is 72.8%. English 2 is a 47 out of 50, and that's 94%. Math 1 is 13 out of 16, and that is 81.25%. Math 3 is 15 out of 21, which is a 71.43%. Cindy McNeil earned the Cliffhanger Award for her awesome English 2 EOC scores. Abby Turner, an 11th grader at J.P. Knapp Early College High School, has been busy showcasing showcasing her art locally and in other states. She's currently entered in the Albemarle County Stores Contest, sponsor, sponsored by the Museum of Albemarle. She has also entered in the Hampton Roads Student Art Gallery Competition in Chesapeake, Virginia. This, concert is for, this contest is for 11th and 12th grade students that go to school in the Hampton Roads area. Winning artwork will be displayed at the Chrysler Museum of Art as well as the MOCA in Virginia Beach. 
Recruitment for JPK 2023-2024 officially begins January 23rd when JPK teams visit CCMS and MMS for eighth grade presentations. For Jarvisburg Elementary School, the 2023 year is off to a strong start at Jarvisburg Elementary. Our fifth grade sheriff's contest essay winners had lunch with Batman and recorded their public service announcement. Check our social media for the finished product. We are looking forward to our Title I Family Reading Night on the 25th. Our title team has planned a great evening for our families. The Wood Ducks on Knott's Island have flown into 2023 headfirst. Our students will be celebrating our first semester awards assembly on February 3rd. Plans are being finalized for our next big reading initiative that will allow students to earn the privilege of attending a celebration later this spring. We are excited to continue our learning as we begin the second semester. For Moyoc Elementary, there's a flurry of activity happening at Moyoc Elementary during the next several weeks. Moyoc Elementary is planning for their first semester awards, awards day and is excited for families to celebrate student progress on Friday, February 3rd. Then on Thursday, February 9th, Moyoc Elementary will host its first parent information night. Kindergarten through five teachers will present curriculum information to parents while Moyoc Elementary students get to experience the JB Rattles in action. Keep an eye out for a flyer and more details to come. For, for Moyoc Middle School, Moyoc Middle School Band Director Sarah Levin took three brave seventh grade students to Greenville to audition for the Eastern District Honors Band. We are so proud of Aaliyah Lorochelle and Alyssa Whiteside and Callie Barth for auditioning. We invite everyone to congratulate Callie on being placed into the All District Middle School Concert Band. Additionally, Moyoc Middle is serving our Winter Sports Pep Rally on Friday, January 20th and looking forward to the first semester awards on, fam on February 9th. And lastly, Shawboro Elementary School. Shawboro will host its first semester awards on February 1st. We are excited to celebrate student accomplishments. We are gearing up for our Boost of Fun Fun Run. Student registration opens this week also. We kick off our program on February 2nd, where students will participate in character building lessons and challenges while we are all trying to raise pledges for our school. We will accumulate the program on February 10th for our whole school fun run. Make sure, to, make sure you pledge a Shawboro student to run laps. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll have a work session review from uh, Dr. Lutz. <coughs> uh, during our work session, which was rather lengthy this afternoon, um, we had our first reading of a number of policies. Um, we also discussed two budget amendments that are on the consent agenda. And we had an in-depth discussion around the 21-22 audit. Um, when that is presented today, we will not see it anywhere near the level of um, depth that we went into. It was about a 45 to 50 minute presentation. And we also had a diploma track presentation, which is coming up here shortly. We had a very robust discussion there and expect some of that to continue this evening. Okay, thank you. So um, it is now time for our approval of agenda. Do I have a motion for approval of our agenda tonight? I make a motion that we approve the agenda. And do I have a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second for approval of agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, so the agenda has been approved. <clears throat> and at this time, um, I would like to um, offer the floor to um, Dr. Lutz, Dr. Bagwell, um, Mr. McCree, and um, Paul O'Neill for the diploma track presentation and resolution. Thank you. Sorry, Paul. I'll try to take you out. I know. Well, this is, this is the first time in two and a half years I've been on this, this seat side talking of to this it. <laughs> I'm usually in another location. Thanks so much. There's been a Oh, we got the room clear out. Okay. There has been an ongoing discussion uh, in Currituck County for a number of years regarding the diploma options that are available to students. Um, recently, a group has gathered that included politicians, COA presidents, superintendents, county commissioners, 
and a number of COA employees as well. And through that work, uh, we are bringing a proposal to the board tonight and looking for a resolution to move forward. I'm going to turn the, this over to Mr. Paul O'Neill. Thank you, Dr. Lutz. <clears throat> board, Madam Chairman, thanks for allowing us to do this presentation. Um, I was at the work session and we went through this earlier, but I'll, I'll be abbreviated now. Um, several years ago, I was approached by uh, Dr. Dobney um, to talk about CTE vocational training and partnering with the College of the Albemarle as I was the chairman of the College of Albemarle at that time. Um, we put a small group together. It was uh, a couple of commissioners, some school board members, uh, the president of COA and some of his staff. And we started the discussions about how we could better utilize College of the Albemarle for the Curry Tuck County Schools to provide a well-rounded uh, vocational CT education for those that do not want to go to a four-year university. Uh, right now in North Carolina, you have a one-track uh, educational system and it's to send them to the four-year universities. Well, there's a lot of students that do not want to go to a four-year university, but they need to find a way to be productive citizens in Curry Tuck County. And so we started those conversations, but Dr. Uh, Weiniger at COA, he left shortly thereafter, and then we kind of didn't get going, and then COVID came and um, kind of uh, slowed things down again. But when Dr. Bagwell came to COA, he and I started having those conversations again and uh, Dr. Bagwell's background from South Carolina was where they did a hybrid type of vocational education with their local high school and helped change the lives of a lot of children. So we got together. I asked, uh, at the time, I was the uh, House representative for Curry Tuck County and Dare and Hyde and uh, Pamlico County, and I asked Senator Hannig to join us as well because there are some impediments to moving forward that have to be uh, addressed through the state. So we had uh, a couple of meetings. Our staff, y'all staff, did a lot of work, and the staff at COA did a lot of work, a lot of background, and put together a lot of information for us to analyze. So tonight we have boiled it down into a presentation that uh, Dr. Lutz and Dr. Bagwell are gonna, gonna get, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't take off where, where uh, Mr. Snowden left off. I also am a product of Curry Tuck <laughs> County. Um, I went to Dr. W.T. Griggs School. I went to Central Elementary School. I went to J.P. Knapp. The first year it was a junior high school and graduated from Curry Tuck High School, which is now the middle school. And uh, as a county commissioner, I oversaw the building of the new high school and several of the other schools we, we, and additions we've done in Curry Tuck. So uh, education's always been important to me, and I've always strived to make sure my children became all that they could be. But we also need to understand not every child is a four-year college student. And what we're going to present tonight is another path that uh, gives other students hope. Uh, beyond just getting out of high school. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Lutz and Dr. Bagwell. Let's not get thrown off. Ike, we're glad you're here as county manager. I wanna make sure your board knows that that 50-50 number is not the correct number at this point in time. <laughs> that includes everyone that is currently in Curtis County K-12 private charter and homeschool. Uh, Currently, some, and, and the data that we pulled from was my future NC, and they're stating that 84% of our ninth graders in Currituck graduate within four years. 12.4% of young adults aged 16 to 24 in Currituck were not working in 2019. And I want to bring your attention, that was in 2019, and we know that since COVID has hit, and on the other side of this, we have more people not working than ever before, and we have an entire generation of, of young men in particular in that age range that are not employed and we are we don't even necessarily know what they are doing um, so part of our goal here is to find a way to engage our students and to give them personalized education thank you dr lutz and thank you all for having me today and allowing me to work with your staff it's been a fantastic experience and i, I just want to say that um 
you are the exemplar for how this can work well. You're already doing a lot of wonderful things, and that's why we're here, to look at how we can expand opportunities. On my slide, you see, how can we make a difference? But I want to I remind you that the state of North Carolina has said we need to do better. That's why they have the My Future NC initiative that is backed by the legislature. We also have talked to the board superintendent, state board superintendent, who has encouraged us to seek local legislation. Why? Because we can make a difference. We can do better. It doesn't mean we're not doing a good job. It means we can do a better job. And I think for North Carolina to remain the first in business, for Curry Tuck to remain in the uh, envied economic position that you're all in, I think we need to look at things differently. And I don't think we could have had a better lead in than the FBM, FBLA students and looking at all of those opportunities. The vast majority of those opportunities are career and technically related. A couple of them, maybe not so much, but entrepreneurship, the business programs, the accounting programs, all of those you can get started with in high school. So when we look at how we make a difference, it is how do we not do things totally different because the people that need to go to university, God bless them, God speed, let's help them get there. But I said to you all in the work session, I'm going to say again, that I have a bachelor's degree, I have a master's degree, I have a PhD. I make a lot less money than a lot of our students who go through the career and technical paths, and I believe that the right path for me was that bachelor's degree. But I don't believe that's the only way to do it. The worst thing that we've done to students is to convince them that they're not good enough if they don't follow a pathway. So I would hope that we would look at this. We're going to work through this in our seven-county service area. We're starting here because y'all do a fantastic job. We have more J.P. Nappers. I learned later that they are called <coughs> that at times. But we have students leading the college from your district. So they're doing well. And they're not all university transfer. There's some career and technical folks that are doing a fantastic job. So pathways are there. But we're leaving students behind. We don't need to leave anybody behind. Thank you. Thank you. So we're fortunate, again, to bring many different people together to help create this presentation. And one of the things we looked at was the North Carolina State Board of Education and their strategic plan and how does this proposal align with the state board as well. Their number one goal is to eliminate opportunity gaps by 2025. One of their objectives was decrease the high school dropout rate. State Superintendent Truitt has Operation Polaris. And she, in that, she talks about reforming accountability and testing. That was already mentioned this evening. And the vision was to transform the K-12 accountability system to ensure a sound and basic education for every student by measuring success based on preparedness for the workforce, higher education, and robust civic participation. There was also an emphasis on a multi-measure tool to look at student success. Currently, the state is looking at revamping the entire state report card so that it better shows the value that our schools bring to our communities and to our state. In addition, reforming and accountability and testing, they want to create that report card template to reflect sound basic education criteria, preparedness for civic life, career, or college, not just college. It should be easy to communicate and understand. That's the goal of the report card. So my message to you all is that College of the Albemarle stands ready to expand program offerings. Again, not a criticism of what you've done. You've done a great job. But we have opportunities in business, computer, college transfer, general education. You see the list here. Dr. Lutz and I were at a meeting the other day, as he mentioned, uh, with 14 community college presidents, 29 school districts in the east part of the state, uh, STEM East, who were legislators there, um, Superintendent Truett was there. The bottom line was, let's do better for our students. Let's do something different. Let's move the needle, make sure everybody has an opportunity. My simple message to, do, to you from COA is whatever we can do to work with you, we are willing to do. We want to make sure that all of our programs are offered to you and to your students. And if there are new programs that we can partner in, 
that we can expand to, you have my commitment that we will do everything within our power to make every opportunity available to your students. I think we're ready for the video. Here it comes. We are in our second year of uh, operation, just beginning our second year of operation in this facility, and it's been a, a game changer, really. So it's allowed us to do more of our arts and sciences, general education courses in the current building, the public safety building. Of course, we do specialized courses in the annex, but what it did for our regional aviation and technology training center is allow us to convert some space. So we're bringing some trades to this area. We know that HVAC is a, a dire need on the Outer Banks and in Curry Tuck because of the expansion, so we're bringing that, and our dean and our faculty are working diligently to make sure that we bring some of the technical trades to Curry Tuck to augment what we're already doing. Curry Tuck's one of the fastest growing counties in North Carolina, one of the fastest growing counties in the nation per capita. So we are certainly proud and glad and appreciative of having a campus like this in Curry Tuck important to, to increase educational opportunities for citizens of the county. Curry Tuck is well known for its strong education uh, system, going back to Joseph Knapp and uh, his, his uh, investment in Curry Tuck County and its educational uh, system. This kind of piggybacks off of the uh, Aviation Technology Training Center and partnership that Curry Tuck County has with uh, College of the Albemarle, a, a fine facility that we built that has in there training for uh, aviation related uh, industry. Um, and so this was just a, a natural extension of that ongoing partnership. We felt it also important to bring into Curry Tuck County basic law enforcement training. And we've, we still have some idea, perhaps in the future, of, of building a fire training facility somewhere on county property uh, in this area. So again, further educational opportunity, but also uh, Curry Tuck support and respect for uh, emergency responders. Anything that we do, we try to think central and flexible. So we want to make sure we can pull as many people in as we can to our campuses and the location of this is perfect for bringing folks from the Outer Banks, from of course all over Curry Tuck, Camden, even Elizabeth City because we are so small as a college that we cannot duplicate or replicate programs everywhere. So we have to be strategic in where we put programs, where we put our campuses, where we put our facilities, where we put our money. And so this was certainly a, a no-brainer, if you will, for an expansion of our Curry Tuck facility and expansion of our program here. Because we, again, pull from even J.P. Knapp Early College, the Camden Early College, and of course the location makes it easy to get to with uh, the road access. I just want to say, as president of College of the Albemarle, we cannot uh, underestimate the importance of this facility and this partnership with Curry Tuck County and we're not done yet so we have other plans and I know Curry Tuck wants to have a strong community college they are supportive of College of the Albemarle and the Board of Commissioners and the citizens we could not be more thankful to you all for the support that you provided for this facility and we plan to make sure that we provide the bang for the buck we want to bring back economic impact the economic impact currently for College of the Albemarle is $105.3 million per year. So we spread that out over seven counties, obviously, but the more educational opportunities we can bring to an area, the more the economic impact, the more return on investment that the county has made in us. The current legislation that was enacted and put into place by 2014 speaks to all students in North Carolina getting Math 1, Math 2, Math 3, which is Algebra 2, Trig, and Pre-Cal, and a fourth math course. A principal can exempt a student from the future Ready Core math requirements. However, the school or district will be penalized under the current state accountability model. 
95% of students in the district must pass Math 3 to meet rigorous math standards. We're proposing the term technical math to personalized learning. Students could benefit by providing personalized learning options to include technical math courses. As evidenced by 42% of high school graduates electing a post-secondary pathway other than enrollment in a four-year university. And of the 58% that went off to school, 34% of high school graduates electing to attend a four-year university actually completed a degree within six years. So we're proposing to add a diploma track with a vocational focus for high school students, allowing them to choose a CTE pathway that leads to employment. The, keep the four math courses, but eliminate the requirement of math three. The two additional math courses, for example, could be math 110 or higher and CTE related. Should legislation regarding math three remain, consider changing the percentage from 95 to 80 percent of students in the district must pass math three for proficiency. Eliminate the penalty for students who are exempt from future ready core. This is a barrier for students who wish to take a strong CTE pathway. Paul? Yeah, uh, we need your help. And just to clarify, we're not asking to do away with four maths. What we are asking to do is allow a student that wants to get a vocational education, take a math that's relevant to their career path. That's what we're asking. Right now, you don't have that flexibility. So we think that uh, now is the time. Uh, Superintendent Truitt uh, has, has been made aware of what we're asking. She encouraged us to go forward with it and that uh, they are looking favorably at, at what was just presented to you. So what we're asking for you tonight is a resolution of support <laughs> And then we're also going to get a resolution of support from College of the Albemarle and from Curry Tuck County and carry it forward. And Senator Hannig is uh, already working the halls and uh, paving the way to allow Curry Tuck or Northeastern North Carolina to start down this pathway of offering something that all of our students can feel a part of. So we just ask for your support for the resolution tonight. Thank you. And I will um, read the resolution now. Is that? Whereas North Carolina currently recognizes only one pathway to graduation for all students in accordance with the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction's Future Ready Course of Study, and whereas North Carolina's current math requirements for all students are NC Math 1, Algebra 1, Math 2, Geometry, Math 3, Algebra to trigonometry pre-calculus plus a fourth math course. And whereas the current math requirement for North Carolina graduates may present a barrier for students, increasing the number of dropouts, which potentially contributes to 84% of Curry Tuck ninth graders completing high school in four years, and whereas students could benefit by providing personalized learning options to include technical math courses as evidenced by 42% of high school graduates electing a post-secondary pathway other than enrollment in a four-year university, and as evidenced by 34% of those high school graduates electing to attend a four-year university actually complete, completing a degree, and whereas our educational system should be designed to allow all K-12 students a personalized education as approved in the North Carolina State Board of Education Strategic Plan 2019-2025, and whereas offering students a personalized education experience in K-12 would give them a direct pathway to College of the Albemarle. College of the Albemarle is the community college serving seven counties of northeastern North Carolina, including Curry Tuck, providing numerous opportunities for students to transform their tomorrow through career and technical pathways as well as those seeking four-year university experiences. And whereas students and our communities could benefit from the certifications, diplomas, and degrees through, available through College of the Albemarle, contributing to positive economic impacts throughout this region. And whereas a renewed emphasis should be placed 
on opportunities for high school students to pursue professional technical certifications through career and co college promise and career and technical education, or vocational ed, pathways as evidenced by 152 students in Curry Tuck County completing 152 career and technology techni technical education concentrations in 2021. And whereas students earning a trade or vocational diploma have the opportunity to enter into meaningful careers and accrue little to no student loan or college debt, and whereas we must join together to support all students in meeting their educational and career goals as evidenced by the North Carolina State Board of Education Strategic Plan 2019 to 2025, to eliminate opportunity gaps and to improve school and district performance, also as evidenced by State Superintendent Truitt's Operation Polaris Reforming Accountability and Testing Vision, to transform North Carolina's K-12 accountability system to ensure a sound basic education for every student by measuring success based on preparedness for the workforce, higher education, and robust civic participation. Therefore, be it resolved that the Curry Tuck County Board of Education requests that the State Board of Education amend the career and college ready graduation requirement framework to provide an additional secondary diploma track that recognizes and values career and college promise and career and technical education. Be it further resolved that the Curry Tuck County Board of Education recommends that a career and technical education diploma track include technical math course options after the completion of math two, informational literacy as it relates to career and college promise, career and technical education. And if we sign this, it would be adopted by the Curry Tech County Board of Education. Do I have a motion that we um, approve um, this resolution? Can we have discussion? I'm not before we have a motion. I make a motion that we approve this resolution to move forward with giving your students a choice. Do I have a second? I'll second that motion. Okay. And um, we um, will, if there is discussion, we will begin by um, offering the first um, discussion to the person who made the motion, and then we'll go in an orderly fashion. Well, that would be me. <laughs> so, you know, I have, um, well, I taught school for a long, long time, and I have two children, and I've seen over and over how one size does not fit all. Uh, I have one child that wanted nothing more than to go the university route, and I had another one who that just wasn't his cup of tea. Um, I, I've talked to Ms. Dowdy over the years that I've been on the board six years, and I've had concerns about children who we were losing because they just weren't interested in that university track. So I think this would be, this is not saying they can't all take math three and go higher, but it, it gives them maths that gives them a choice for maths that may benefit them if they're a plumber or an electrician or something in the trade. So I, I'm, I'm concerned with us losing even one child because of what we're offering. So if we can offer a choice and only one child takes it, then I feel like we've won. So. Ms. Peters, do you have anything to add to that? Just as we discussed earlier in depth, and I said, you know, I support this as well. Um, not everybody wants to, you know, has that college uh, plan, um, and I do believe they do need options. Um, this isn't something new. I know we've been we've been talking about it. Um, you know, our previous board member, Dr. Dabney, was always, you know, talking about it. Um, so this isn't something new. But I do think that um, we do need to offer something. Um, as it's been discussed tonight, we, have, we do have students that even now, more so after COVID, that they need to be reached. They need to have options. 
they need so we need to have ways to reach them and offer them different paths um, because the, the world is different so um, I just like I said I'm in favor okay miss Parker um, I, I was um, I had a lengthy discussion during the work session and I just want to be really clear that I absolutely support career and technical education. I want children to have a choice to enroll, enlist, or employ. I cannot support the resolution at this time because I have too many questions. It does not mean that I don't support CTE. It does not mean that I don't think that children have an option. What it means is I think we have a narrative in this county that we have an academic diploma, and that is not what we have. We have one diploma. If you want to go the university route, you have to take foreign language. If you don't want to go the university route, there are 16 required courses out of 28. You have 12 opportunities to take CTE, to take welding, to take fire safety, to take nursing. I don't know that this is the approach we need to go. I might circle back and think that, but to me there's just too many unanswered questions I cannot sign my name to something without asking questions. I've said it before. You already passed a resolution that you found out wasn't a resolution that you really wanted to pass. It only had Math 1 on it, and now you've backtracked on that resolution. So I would prefer we actually take the time and we see what the resolution needs to have. I need data on our current Math 3 failure rate. I need that data. I need to know how many children are actually failing Math 3. I need data. This proposal is that students are going to take Math 110. My question is what happens to all the kids that can't test into Math 110? Because I need data from COA because currently our students that are enrolling at COA aren't getting into Math 110 because they can't get in and they're having to take remedial math. So I'm concerned that this isn't going to reach the kid we're worried about reaching because they're not going to be able to get into Math 110. They can't get in it now. Our kids that are going to COA can't get into 110 now. This is a problem that's starting in third grade when children can't multiply. And then it's going to fourth grade. And then it's going to fifth grade. And then we all want to act surprised when a ninth grader says, I don't want to do math three. Well, of course they don't want to do math three. They couldn't multiply in third grade. So I cannot support this this time because there's just too many unanswered questions. I am excited about Dr. Bagwell. I'm excited that he is here. I think we can do great things starting in the fall if we get ready, put our heads down and work. Let's go to Dr. Durham. Let's go to our CTE director and say, what can we do in the fall to make sure our children know what CTE classes they can go to? I think I need to know how many children are going into remedial math from Currituck High School. I already know part of the answer. So for us to think they're going to go into Math 110 and rainbows and unicorns are going to happen and we're suddenly going to get fourth math, four math credits aren't going to happen. Because if you can't do multiplication and division, you can't do college Math 110. I will not be voting to support the resolution tonight, but that's not really going to matter because I'll be outvoted. But I'm on the record. Mr. Banks. The only thing that's... Um is, is concerning that's a, that's a very low number of, of kids that actually graduate from from high school with the intent to go to college and then they don't even complete college um, there's got to be a different opportunity for, for the kids um, I personally think this is a good opportunity um, for the kids um, but I also think it's, it's a parent it's a parent and a student decision it's not just the student's decision to do this um, so I am I am going to support this resolution well I'm in favor of it for several reasons one of which our neighboring um, state Virginia has five diploma tracks we have one um, and when superintendent Truitt came on board that was one of the first things she said that we needed to do something about that so I am in support of it I just want to make one comment because I was an educator in Virginia for quite some time. People are comparing apples and oranges and we continue to do that. There are different diploma tracks in the state of Virginia and to get a general diploma you have to have verified credits. That means you have to pay, pass state test. So if our diploma required children to pass state test, nobody would be getting a diploma in Currituck County. There are diplomas for children that have IEPs, 
their certificate of attendance, there's an advanced studies diploma, but a general diploma in the state of Virginia requires verified credits that you pass a certain number of state end of grade testing. God forbid that come to Curry Tuck because we're rocking out about 30%. So that's what our graduation rate would be. So I just ask when people speak about things, they don't compare apples and oranges. It's not even the same category. Okay. I want to say Thank one you. more thing too, please. I too am encouraged that Superintendent Truitt is receptive to this because I, we had this, we had two pathways and we took it away. And so perhaps now people are seeing maybe we made a mistake when we took that second choice away. So again, I, you know, I do support it. What okay. year did we take away the second pathway? Did we not? What year was that? Um, well, it was it was offered. Uh, my son graduated in 2010, and it was offered when he was a freshman. So it had to be sometime after. That would be some good data to get. So we should have had outstanding graduation rates when we offered this diploma. I'll do some research. Our graduation rates should have been through the roof because that seems to be what the solution is. Again, it's all about choice, not well, one size well, no, fits all. No, it's all about kids graduating. Okay, we're, is what it's we've about. discussed this matter at length, and I think we know where everyone stands at this point. So is there a motion to close the debate and proceed to a vote? I make a motion to close the debate. Do I have a second? I'll Don't second that. Call the vote. All those in favor of the approving uh, the resolution as I read it, please state by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion carries. <clears throat> and I want to thank you all for being here and uh, for your presentation. Yes, thank you all for coming. Thank Dr. You Bagwell, so much for your work. Mr. O'Neill, Mr. Ike, thank you. Thank you for coming. And At all this... of the other folks from CLA. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, uh, I would like to um, us to look at the audit that we um, had presented to us earlier today. Um, so if Mr. Oh, I'm going to mess it up. <laughs> My name is Adam Saperic. I'm a partner Thank you so with Anderson much. Smith White, <clears throat> your external auditors. Um, uh, as stated before, we've already gone over these financial statements, talked about some of the reasons for the changes. Uh, tonight, I'm just going to point out, again, the key pages that I think are most important. Uh, first one being page one. This is the opinion letter for the actual financial statements. Uh, it states in the first paragraph that we believe that these financial statements accurately reflect the financial position and the fund balance for Currituck County Schools as of June 30, 2022. This is considered a clean, unmodified opinion letter. Uh, throughout these statements, there are numerous uh, pages of information regarding the financial position uh, of the school system. There's a couple of key exhibits that I think are most important to the board and to management for uh, overseeing and managing the finances of the school systems and those center around fund balance. So if you turn to page 14, exhibit three, this is a balance sheet for all of your governmental funds. Your general fund balance as of June 30, 2022 was 1,781,000. That's an increase of 446,000 from last year. And if you look back to June 30, 2018, Four years ago, that number was 672,000. So I think a nice healthy increase over the last four years. Um, if you look at your fund <coughs> balance as a percentage of your local funds, the uh, general fund and the other special revenue fund, <clears throat> um, the 1,781,000 uh, available unrestricted fund balance uh, as a percentage of the let's say $15 million of local funds between your general fund and the other special revenue fund, it equates to the average $50,000 annual income household having about $7,000 in savings. So uh, I think it's a, a, a nice um, uh, amount, uh, safety amount, uh, uh, catch-all. Uh, 
uh, for any unfunded mandates that might come from uh, the state. Uh, Currituck County Schools is heavily funded locally, and so your need for fund balance is higher than other districts that have uh, dif different demographics and different uh, local funding percentages. <clears throat> you also have $169,000 of available fund balance in the other special revenue fund. Your capital outlay fund has $600,000 of fund balance, and the individual schools have about $700,000 across all those schools. <clears throat> Page 16 is the income statement for those same funds. You can see that your general fund collects $12,965,000. The state public school fund provides nearly $32 million of funding. And this year, the federal grants fund was $5.1 million. That increase uh, from 2019 is related to COVID funds received in the current year. When I look back at your 2019 financial statements pre-COVID, your typical federal funding per year is about $1.5 million. Uh, so again, a significant increase, uh, $3.4 million of that being related to uh, education stabilization funds, um, also known as those COVID funds. At the bottom of each of those uh, columns, you can see the change in fund balance. Again, $446,000 increase in general fund. Your other special revenue fund, which is your other local source, used $87,000 of fund balance. Your capital outlay fund used $123,000. And your individual schools raised $126,000. Uh, as students return to uh, sports and fundraisers and field trips. <clears throat> you also have one business type fund, page 22, exhibit seven. <clears throat> Your child nutrition fund. <clears throat> this fund includes assets and liabilities that um, offset and kind of hide the financial position of the fund, you have the value of the kitchen equipment, net of depreciation, booked directly on your balance sheet. You also have the value of the pension liability and post-employment benefits related to child nutrition employees as a liability here. That's really a state liability, but it affects your net position. So I like to look at cash as the key indicator of financial health. And so at the top of page 22, you see that cash and cash equivalents were $1,145,000. That's an increase of $1 million from last year. Uh, that fund has more cash on hand than it probably has in two decades. Um, the current year, we saw all kids returning to school full time. We saw uh, all kids eating for free, a federal uh, mandate. And the reimbursement rate from the federal government for those meals was uh, higher than it's ever been. So it allowed you to receive almost $2.2 million of federal reimbursements from the federal government, as shown on page 23, the income statement. That $2.2 million compares to 2019, again, pre-pandemic. In a normal year, you receive $646,000 of federal reimbursements, as well as having $400,000 of sales. So typical year, a million dollars in sales and reimbursements, and this year being 2.2 million. So uh, that resulted in that increase in cash and cash equivalents. Uh, we've seen that uh, statewide. Um, the high reimbursement rates are coming back down to normal. All kids no longer eat for free and have to start paying for meals. So the anticipation there is that that cash will be used to really fund future years of declining cash availability in that fund. <clears throat> After that, we have pages and pages of footnotes, but on page 64, we have another letter. Again, part of the audit is to uh, determine our opinion on the financial statements, as well as to conduct a review of internal controls, uh, review and audit of state compliance requirements, and an audit of federal compliance requirements. Page 64 starts one of three letters, all three again being clean, unmodified opinions, stating that we noted no deficiencies in internal controls, we noted no exceptions with state compliance requirements, and we noted no exceptions with federal, state, or federal spending requirements for all the programs that we audited as major, those being the <clears throat> EC cluster, the Child Nutrition Fund, and uh, your two 
COVID funds, the education stabilization funds and the state bonus, or the, it was really a federal bonus, but it came through the state public school fund uh, for all employees. Uh, all COVID funds are considered high risk and have to be audited every year for compliance. Page 76 is uh, the listing of your federal and state awards. And I just want to point out one number in the middle of page 76, your total education stabilization funds, those federal COVID funds, totaled $3,339,000 this year. Again, part of that increase in federal funds from 1.5 to the 5.1 in revenues. And to me, those are the key highlights uh, from the statements. Um, on a, uh, just a summary of the audit, again, it, uh, it went as planned. It has been submitted to the LGC, reviewed by them, and approved. Uh, Susan and her team were uh, very responsive to all our requests. Uh, in total, an audit takes hundreds of hours, thousands of pieces of paper uh, from reports, invoices, check copies, um, digging into your details, and then there's a significant burden of request uh, from the finance department so that we have items to actually audit. So um, we provide lists and requests, uh, and her and her team have, uh, for both of our visits in the spring and the fall, are very responsive and have all those documents available to us so that when we arrive, we can actually do our job and do the audit in the most efficient way possible. Okay. And that's all I've got for tonight. Thank you so much. Yep. Mr. Superic, <laughs> I had it written down in my teacher, you know, spelling so I could say it, but it was on another piece of paper. Thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. Um, just, um, real quick, sorry, for, from the work session, I don't remember if you just said that or not, but we did have an increase in our fund balance, so that was a significant good thing. Yes, correct? your general fund balance went up 446000 Your other special revenue, which is also mainly local sources, went down eighty seven. So a net uh, 300 and something thousand dollar increase in local fund balance. Uh, again, I think to a more reasonable safe uh, you know, safety net. Um, and I, I think, uh, again, the highest fund balance you've had in a few years. We're seeing statewide fund balance ac uh, across all the districts we work with, nearly all of them increasing. Uh, uh, fund balance, we, we do have some that went down, but those were typically counties that had too much fund balance and had already had plans to, with their county to spend it down. Uh, but the, that increase in federal funds, uh, along with other savings, I think really helped most districts statewide add to fund balance. Uh, the additions to fund balance um, in, in discussions and in, in the work and working with these districts was really anticipating for when those federal funds expire. There is gonna be continued cost because of COVID for technology, uh, for personal protection equipment that um, had previously not been required prior to 2019. So uh, districts statewide are adding fund balance, knowing that there will be additional cost after those federal funds expire. Uh, those funds are going to set to expire in 2023, 2024. Um, whether some of those programs will be uh, extended or not is uncertain, but um, there will be uh, challenges ahead on on how to fund some of those things that are being paid for with those federal funds. Could you could you tell us recommended we it is recommended that we have a certain number of months in the fund balance? Uh, there was actually uh, that question co comes up all the time, and there was actually a blog post um, somewhere maybe maybe the uh, ASBO, the Association of School Boards um, officers, but the. The old notion was that you needed 7%. Um, and this blog post basically said that it is not dictated anywhere. And that's because it's different county by county. There are, uh, you know, when you look at your $12 million of local funds uh, revenue compared to $30 million of state funds, that's unique to you. Uh, a district just down the road might have $4 million of local fund compared to $40 million of state funds just based on their demographics and their uh, property taxes. Right. So uh, it really is a case-by-case -case basis. So there is no set 7%. Uh, what I like to look at is looking back, how much fund balance have you used 
in any given year in the last few years because obviously you can get back to that. There are uh, districts that if you, you it might use $300,000 of fund balance, but if you've got $3 million, you can do that for 10 years. So that's just kind of the, the math I look at. Uh, if you have a history of using $500,000 of fund balance and you have 1.7 on hand, you can do that for three years. So I think really looking at past history uh, and also future budgets, uh, how many years can you live off of that fund balance? It's difficult to tell right now, again, because of those federal funds, uh, whether uh, next year's budget is set to use fund balance or not and how, how you look halfway through the year, um, you know, you can anticipate whether you're going to use fund balance or not. But I really like to look at how much fund balance you have compared to how much you can use. And uh, not a certain amount of operating. A certain amount. Mm -hmm. uh, I really look at it as years. Um, I've described uh, school finance uh, almost like steering a battleship. It, it might take a couple of years to go from using fund balance to adding fund balance. And that's just because there are decisions, whether they are reoccurring expenditures or one-time expenditures or a mix of both, that have to happen to change whether you're using or adding fund balance. So, uh, yeah, there is no one set, uh, no, uh, set amount. It's more of a, um, a feeling, you know, looking at, again, what you've used in the past and what you have available. I think at $1.7 million, knowing that you were down as low as 600000 and again, that $12 million of local funds on hand, uh, again, if you add the two local fu funding sources, you're at $14 million. You know, so you're just over 10%. I don't think that's unreasonable compared to other districts. Again, especially with your high level of local funding. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we need to take action on this. Do I have a motion for approval of the audit uh, as um, Mr. Superic has presented to us? I'll make a motion to approve okay. it. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a sec first and a second, or a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. So the audit is approved, and we thank you so thank much. You. Thank you for your time thank tonight. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, at this time, we have a construction update from Dr. Lutz. Uh, we'll touch on enrollment numbers okay. as we're bringing up the uh, presentation. Um, we had contracted with OREd through Ohio, uh, through North Carolina State, to um, give us our projections for our growth, especially at the northern end of the county. And um, just reviewed these before the meeting, and again, uh, pretty reliable on the projections. Uh, even with the growth, there's been some discussion that with the higher interest rates, uh, our housing may slow down. Um, we're not seeing it just yet in our schools. We're keeping a close eye on things, but we're right about uh, projection numbers with, within 20 in most schools. All right, so our construction update, things are moving along um, on target with Mayock Elementary and Mayock Middle School. We have some pictures here. And we like to give them monthly with the update. You can actually see the progress. I, I went by Mayock Elementary this earlier today, and the brick is almost finished on the entire exterior except for the front. Okay. And the company has done a wonderful job of match, matching the brick with the existing school with the new build. It's going to look very seamless. And again, I think best of all is that we're going to have an enclosed campus for the cafeteria. We won't have to have students leave the building to uh, head to the cafeteria, which Mayock Elementary cannot wait to have their cafeteria <laughs> open again. I bet. Okay. So dining room, roof, and windows getting, getting ready to move forward, and the connection has been made. So pretty soon we're going to be able to start working on the interior shell of the building. Mayock Middle School, again, a much easier project. I uh, went by and put eyes on that as well. Um, they have moved pretty much completely inside at this point. Uh, they have all the brick completed on the outside, and they're going to stop on the outside work for the time being, move inside. And once that's done, they're going to head back out and begin the walkways and pathways and cleaning up the exterior. And I'll continue to say Sussex is a pleasure to work with. Um, they are a top-notch company, and they meet the deliverables, and they, they work very well with our staffs on site. You can see the soundboards were installed in the uh, chorus room and also in the band room. Okay. 
and we're going to start moving forward with the finishes. That Mayock Middle School is actually ahead of schedule. And in the future, Tulls Creek site, I will have a much deeper update for you uh, when we come back in February, if not before that. Okay. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you so much. Yeah, Dr. Was... Lutz, when, when you come back in February and you have these enrollment numbers, could we get the numbers for Curry Tuck and J.P. Knapp of the actual number of students that are in the building? I know these are the students that are enrolled, but we have so many students that do early college. Like, so I, I think that number is kind of misleading that there are not 250 children sitting in nap or at the high school if we could get those numbers of the number of kids i would think we'd have to do it per block like how many kids are their first block how many kids are their second block third block and fourth block it would give us a better long-term planning wise to really know for both high schools yes please okay okay so uh we uh, next is the consent agenda. Do I have uh, a motion to approve uh, to approve the consent agenda? I make a motion to approve. <clears throat> and do we have a second? A second. We have a first and a second to approve the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? No. Okay. If not, um, all those um, in favor of uh, approving the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. All those opposed? Okay, so the consent agenda is um, approved. And um, our next um, Board of Education meeting is February 16th. Well, our work session is February 16th, 2023 at PLC at 4 p.m. And then the Board of Education meeting will be here at the Historic County Courthouse at 6.30. What is that date again? Uh, February 16th. Okay. And uh, at this time, we'll start with board uh, member comments. And uh, Ms. Um, Peters, we'll start with you. Well, uh, I just wanted to say great job to Mrs. To Ms. Santa. Um, I attended the uh, play for, or the musical, I guess, for Mamma Mia. It was really a great thing to see. It was so nice. We had. I mean, all of our students in middle school, both middle schools and high schools participated. So it was a great, it was a great show um, to see all that. And I mean, we always say it every year or anytime any of us go to a play, they are simply amazing. They are just really talented. So great job to them and everyone um, who was involved in that. Um, as we talked about, it's kind of been hit on a lot tonight about, and when we started with the invocation about, you know, January being mental health wellness. Like I said, um, it is important. Our kids are still, even though things seem kind of back on the fast track to being somewhat normal, we still do need to really check on each other. Um, I know we're really putting out there a lot of stuff, information. I know all of our schools have great sites to go out there and get all the information you need. Um, this caught my eye this week, our Knott's Island nurse, Nurse Polly, and she did give me permission today to talk about her uh, wood duck wellness, and she put in there a lot of good information for parents at home about breakfast, easy recipes. Um, she still does a COVID update, and again, she touched on the mental health awareness as well. And she is an advocate for being there for not just not on school, but for her whole community. So I thought that was was nice. Um, I ended up spending a long time at Not Silent Elementary today. I was stumbled in, and the hundred year anniversary is coming up for that school. So, like I said, a hundred years. So I know when we have joint meetings with the commissioners, we do talk about this a lot. Our schools, some of them are very old. So. <laughs> Um, that's something exciting they were we were all digging in the history of that and there's just so much history in there and I know this will be talked about they are hoping to plan uh, how get a committee together and have some type of celebration when that comes up so I'm sure there'll be more information on that forthcoming but I just um, hope everyone continues on having a good week month thank you that's it Miss Parker yeah, I wanted to thank Miss Rose for taking the time tonight to do the moment of silence. And I just wanted to use this time um, to personally thank the Currituck community for their outpouring of generosity um, towards Honesty's family. Her siblings are within our school system and her close friends, and they're going to need our support. It was a horrific, tragic death. 
and, and they're going to need us. So for all of the families that have suffered losses and, and for hers, um, that is so untimely, I just wanted to share a quote. Grief never ends. It is a passage, not a place to stay. Grief is not a sign of weakness, nor a lack of faith. It is the price of love. Thank you. Mr. Banks. As the uh, newest member of the board, um, I would like to thank uh, Janet for the nomination and the support of the, uh, of the board. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, asking questions and, uh, and uh, looking forward to serving just not just the kids, but the community as a whole. So. Okay, thank you. Ms. Well, Rose? I too attended Mamma Mia, and it was amazing. I That is one of my favorite movies, so I got right into that musical. Um, I also attended the NAP Awards, and I was so proud of all of those students, and I was able to go see a wrestling match at the high school, which that was on my bucket list for this year, and I went to a swim meet over at the YMCA, and basketball and at the high school and also the big game between Curry Tuck County Middle School and Moyock Middle School. That was a nail biter. And I saw the manager of Curry Tuck County Middle School doing a great job. So it was a great night. Um, I did visit several elementary schools and I was down yesterday at Jarvisburg. Several of our schools have little libraries and if you have extra books that your children have outgrown, feel free to donate them. And if your children need some books to read, they are welcome to take one. They're free. Yeah, Shawbra so, has one now, too, doesn't she? Shawbra, I think, Griggs, Knott's Island, Jarvisburg. There's one out at the Recreation Park. Moyock Woman's Club works to try and help those stay stocked as well. So uh, your support there would be appreciated. Again, I encourage each of you, if you've got some time, to volunteer, be a reading buddy. I went and had my fix this week with my little buddy. He's moving right along. It only takes a few minutes each week to make a difference. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome Mr. Jason Banks to the board. I, um, I, I know you're hitting the ground running, and you will work hard, and you'll be there for the <coughs> students. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yesterday, we had a great moment here in the county with the Wounded Warrior Project. Uh, I know Kevin McCord helped organize that, and what a great moment it was as the, the troops went through the entire county, and there were so many people on the roadside just celebrating that moment. It was uh, definitely a patriotic time. Uh, we also had a tech director's meeting statewide, come and visit Sharboro under the direction of Sandy Reynolds. I thought that was excellent. Um, accreditation update. Uh, we are moving forward. We are having our meetings and getting ready to hit the ground running. Um, thank you to Susan Mizell and the entire finance department for a fine audit report. And most of all, um, condolences again to the, to, to the Selby family as a, a terrible loss in our community. They took everything I was going to say. <laughs> Um, I also went to see Mamma Mia. I'm not sure who was having more fun, if it was the students on stage or the people out in the audience, because it was really, um, it was really a great show. And uh, between Christmas break and my vacation, I only got to three schools this, uh, well, four if you want to count the high school, um, the play, uh, which is unusual for me. But um, I... Um, was very pleased to see how great it looked at Moyak Elementary. Um, I can't wait until they get the brick in the front so we see what it's going to look like because you know that's my heart. <laughs> um, I spent a lot of years there. Um, but um, And then I went to Shelburne Elementary and Moyak Middle, and um, I also offer condolences to um, the Sparks family and the uh, Anastas uh, family and to um, Miss Cotton. Um, and um, with that said, um, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I make a motion that we adjourn the meeting. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.